good morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. Uh, you know, Scripture says that we're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I've always thought that was probably referring to people that sing like I do as far as being a noise, but as I heard you visiting out here, I thought, no, that's a joyful noise for the people, of, people to be able to come together and encourage one another and just uh, greet one another in the love of the Lord. And so this morning, we pray that you'll be encouraged. We pray that you will be strengthened in your faith and that you'll draw close to the Lord. We certainly, as we come to worship Him in song, that's an opportunity for us to lift our voices up in worship. And so join with us in that in just a moment and let God be glorified. Pray with me, please. Dear God, we thank You for this day. Thank You for each person who is here. Lord, I do pray that you'd, You would draw each of us to Yourself and that You would be glorified in us as we open our mouths to sing Your praises. Lord, I pray for Chip and Jan and Lisa as they lead us in music and just pray, Lord, that You would fill each, fill each one of us with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, that all that we do may be glorifying to You. Bless us one and all. And Lord, we pray that the name of Jesus might be lifted high. For we pray in His name. Amen. Thank you. That's a little close. All right. Well, it's good to see you this morning. I have a picture for you, and I want you to see if you know what this uh -huh. is. You know already? It's paper. It's paper. That's right. <laughs> what is on that paper? What is that? How many cherry. of you know it's what that picture is? It's a cherry. What a is that picture? A cherry. A, it's a, cherry. It's a, a box. box. It's a what? It's an ox and a wagon. It's an ox and a wagon. That's, you are so precise, and you are so right. Now, how many of you, as you think about oxen, how many of you ever thought you'd like to be an oxen? Be an ox. How many of you would like to be an ox? Do you know why they have oxen? It's so they can do a lot of work. So how many of you like to do a lot of work? No, I didn't. <laughs> Watch out, your mom and dad are watching. Okay. So, the people in other countries, we don't do it much in this country, but people in other countries use oxen to pull wagons. Now look at this poor ox. Look what he's having to pull. He's pulling a wagon, and there's how many people on that wagon? Three. Can you tell? Three. There's three people on that wagon. Do you think that's heavy? Do you think that's heavy? Would you like to pull a wagon with three people on it and maybe a lot of other things in that wagon? No. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if I wish I were that strong, that's right. But you know, every day, every day, that's what this ox will do. He works and works and works. Well, sometimes that's a little much for one ox to do, right? And so, many times, what they'll do is they'll put not one ox, but what? Two oxen. They'll put two oxen together, and they put them together using something. You see that that's around their neck? Do you see what that is? Do you know what that is? What is that called? Ropes. Well, there's ropes, all right, but what is that wooden thing around their, around their neck? Do you know what that's called? That is called a yoke. And they put those two oxen together. They have those oxen where they're joined together by that yoke, and that causes them to walk together. And where one may be having a problem because the load is so heavy, two of them pulling, is that going to be a whole lot easier? Yes. It is. No. It is. It is. No. Now, Jesus told us, he said, there's a lot of you that have a, have a hard way to go. And sometimes in your life, there's going to be a time that things are very difficult, that things are very hard, and you're sad. Do you know what Jesus said? He said for us to take his yoke upon us. In other words... Jesus said to allow Him to come alongside of us and help us carry that load. Or for us to walk with Him so that we can be successful. Okay, so that we can do what we need to do. 
Okay? So what do you think about that? Who are we supposed to get to help us whenever? Who's there to help us whenever we have problems? Do you know who it is? Who is it? God. God is? That's right. And so Jesus says, you let me come and come up alongside you and help you in your time of problems, in your time of difficulty. And every day, do you know what we need to do? We need to let Jesus, we need to walk with Jesus. We need to walk with Jesus and let Him be a help to us. So let's pray and thank God that He's always willing to be with us. And let's remember not to start any day without Jesus because there's going to be things we need to do and we can do it so much better when we allow Him to help us. So don't be like that one that says, I'm going to pull it all by myself, but be that one that says, I'm going to walk with Jesus. And that's going to make life a lot easier and my problems a lot easier. So let's pray together. And then we're going to let you go to Children's Church. Are you ready? Bow your heads. Close your eyes, children. Everybody bow your head. Close your eyes. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for each of these children. And I pray that you would draw them close to yourself. And dear God, we just ask that even at this young age, that they would learn to, Lord, to walk with you, that their burdens may be light. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let me ask you a question. Have you taken a few minutes this week to pray for our nation? I encouraged you to do that last week, and I pray that you do that, not just when you're reminded to do, but all the time. We know that that is an essential part of our responsibility as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, to pray for the country that we live in. Now, as we pray, we do so thankfully, because it is a privilege to live in this nation. It has been a great joy and a blessing to be able to grow up in this country. But as we pray for America, we also pray knowing that our nation faces problems. It would be a situation of blindness, willful blindness, for us to say that there are not difficulties within the United States of America. Now, some of those problems are readily discussed by the media and the public. One of those that would come to mind would be the problem of racism. And racism is indeed a problem. But the fact is, according to Scripture, there's only one race, and that is the human race. That's all. All of us, together, we can all trace our roots back to Adam and Eve. So, in that regard, we need to accept one another as being equal and gloriously Different. What a blessing that is that people of every nation, every tongue, people of every shade of color, all of us can come to Jesus. All of us can give praise to God. Now there are, of course, problems facing our nation which we as a nation bring upon ourselves. Often we embrace short-term solutions for problems that we have created ourselves or problems even that have come upon us. And those short-term solutions quite often create long-term problems. And I'll just give you an example. I don't want to talk about this long, but the problem that maybe we can all agree on that is there that we have brought upon ourselves as a nation, and that is the problem of governmental debt. Now, government at every level has created a problem for itself and for all of us by incurring debts which cannot be paid. And the numbers are staggering. One of our members this last week pointed out to me that our national debt is now over $155,000 per taxpayer. Per taxpayer. And it's growing every second. It's, it's a, if you want to get anxious, just look at the national debt clock. Just look at it. For, I, I just, you know, five minutes, just look at it. And I guarantee you there'll be an anxiety creep into your soul about the situation that is there before us. And we know that the state governments are not 
much different. You may know that Massachusetts ranks fourth of all states in total debt. We have a problem. I believe we can certainly agree that that is a problem. So what can be done about such a thing as that? Well, the obvious answer, and I believe this would be a biblical answer, is that you can cut spending and you can raise taxes, or you can do both. And even then, I don't know how long it would take us, probably generations, for the problem to not be there. But you know that the reduction of spending and the raising of taxes are both unpopular with us. Unpopular with the people. Now, I mean, we don't mind them raising taxes on somebody else. Just don't take any more money out of my paycheck and all will be well. And the politicians know that and they want to get reelected. So what do our governments do? Politicians talk about the problems and do nothing and our debt escalates. Our state governments have decided to solve some of their problems, their financial problems, by providing lotteries and casinos so that people, some people say this is a voluntary tax. Nobody forces you to go to the casino. Nobody forces you to, to uh, these state lotteries. And so you're voluntarily taxing yourself. In other words, what the government has said, at whatever level that's taking place, they're saying, let's solve our problems by appealing to the individual's desire for an easy fix or to their greed or simply to their irresponsibility. Let's do that to our citizens. Let's give them opportunity to be irresponsible and that should work. But has it? New problems have been created. Our state governments, our local governments are deeper in debt than ever before. Folks, we know that politicians want us to think that they have plans for how to get us out of our problems. We know that they make lofty promises. They are voted into office on the basis of those plans and promises, and they complete their terms of office with our nation deeper in debt and, may I say, deeper in sin. So I'd be stating the obvious to say that when we look to Washington for the solution to our problems, it is a case of the blind leading the blind and we will all fall into the ditch. It was, I guess you'd say over a generation ago, 1994, that, that doesn't seem like that long ago to me, but it made to some of you, 1994 the Republican Party introduced what was called the Contract with America. And the American public was hungry for change and it responded and the Republicans became the majority party in both houses of Congress. And we know that today that our populace is still hungry for change. But the problem is that what we want is painless change. We as a nation are like the person who wants to lose weight not through exercise, not by eliminating sweets from their diet, but by taking some type of a miracle pill. Just swallow that pill and all of a sudden you begin to lose weight with no sacrifice whatsoever. But no matter what the infomercials say, there is no pill such as that that exists that is safe for you to take. Weight loss requires sacrifice and getting our nation out of its difficulties is going to require sacrifice. Now I'll leave that for a minute, or for a while. More to the point. Some in our nation think that God Himself, now listen to me, some think that God Himself has a contract with America in which He has promised to make a special case out of us. It is as though somewhere in His Word He has promised to bless these United States of America no matter what. Well, if you can find that anywhere in Scripture, you need to correct me. You need to let me know. You see, that attitude did not work for Old Testament Israel, and it will not work for us. Over the next two years, you're going to hear a score of politicians who are seeking to be our next president give their plans for America. Well, I want you to consider instead this morning God's plan for America. God's plan. And he has one. Do you believe that? Well, let's look and see what the Word of God says. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 11. I believe that this passage of Scripture has special relevance to our nation. You see, our Lord is speaking in this passage 
to cities, to municipalities of special privilege. There is no question asked by our Lord in these verses. Rather, there is an answer. And it is one which we all need to hear. So as we look at this in God's plan for America, or His plan for any nation, we would be no different than the others, we are instructed to do this. We are instructed to renew our relationship with God through repentance. That's what He's calling our nation to, to renew our relationship with Him through repentance. Look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20 where the Word of God says this. It says, Then He began to denounce the cities in which most of His miracles were done because they did not repent. He worked those miracles. And He doesn't say because they did not believe. He said that He was denouncing them because they did not repent. In the book of Romans, it says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. That is the work that should be happening. That is what should be taking place when we see the blessings of God. Now this word that is translated denounce means that he brought charges against them because of their actions or rather in this case because of their indifference. You see they had failed to repent despite the miraculous ways in which the Lord had worked in their midst. Now, you know what the word repent means. It means to have a change of mind that results in a change of direction. Because you see, without a change of mind, there is not going to be a change of direction. We simply may go from one thing that is outside the will of God to another thing that is outside the will of God. And even if that thing we go to is more honorable in the eyes of our society, it is still outside the will of God. Now I considered this morning making a list of six sins in our nation and asking you to number them from one to six as to which are the greatest, which might be the greatest sin that our nation is experiencing and of which we need to repent. Because maybe all of us have something that we say this is the biggest problem in our nation. And I just picked a few And so there may be some that you would add to the list. There may be some of these that you would take away from this. And so you say, that's not really a problem. Well, I'm not going to argue with you about that. I just picked six. So let me give them to you. And as you hear them, listen and say, ah, that is it. That is our biggest problem as a nation. If we correct that, then all will be corrected. So let me give you this list in no particular order. Abortion. Sex outside of marriage. The abuse of drugs, including alcohol. Gambling. Homosexuality. And indifference toward God. Now, do you have one of those that you would zero in on and say that is the biggest problem in our nation? Maybe you'd say, well, all of those things are a problem. Maybe you would say there's something you didn't put in the list that I believe is the biggest problem. Well, go ahead and put that out there. Go ahead and decide upon that. And you pray that God will forgive us of that and that we will as a nation turn away from that. But here is my question. Which sin would you list at the top as the greatest sin plaguing our nation? Well, if you'd read this passage before I began to speak, then maybe you would agree that the one that we ought to place at the top of the list before all of the others is that one that I mentioned last, which is indifference toward God. Indifference toward God. And I would say to you that that is where all of our other problems, it all springs from that indifference toward God. Whatever the Bible says doesn't make any difference. We will not respond to it. Now, as I said, he is speaking these words to cities where that they had seen his miracles, where they had seen his blessings, and yet they did not repent. Now, we would say that we as a nation have been blessed, that God has worked wonders in the United States of America. Certainly, we would agree with that. But we need to know that repentance is the proper response to the wonders of God. 
Every time we see God work, every time we see Him do some wonderful thing, and as we study history and we see the wonderful ways in which He has blessed our nation, then that should lead us to repentance based on His wonders. Look at verse 20 again. Then He began to denounce the cities in which most of His miracles were done because they did not repent. Now, can we apply that to nations as well as cities? Can we say that our Lord Jesus would say that he would begin to denounce the nations in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. In the last 250 years, what nation of the world has been more blessed by God than this nation? Our blessings have been so great since the founding of our country that we have come to expect Him to bless us. It's just expected. We're the greatest country on earth. And we think that even if we say, well, God is the one who has blessed us, we presume upon those blessings. But listen to verse 21. Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Chorazin and Bethsaida were cities that were rich and flourishing cities into which the king of kings went working miracles. What a great privilege was there to see Jesus moving in their midst, to see Jesus working in their midst, and yet the people were indifferent toward Him. The Holman Bible Dictionary says that Chorazin was a place famous for its wheat. And it goes on to say this, and I quote, In the time of Jesus, it must have been an important place, but... By the end, by the second half of the third century AD, it had ceased to be inhabited. Greatly blessed, but only a short time later, it had ceased to be inhabited. Of Bethsaida, the word means house of fish, Holman's dictionary reminds us near here, Jesus fed the 5,000 and he healed a blind man. But then it says this, the site of the city has yet to be identified archaeologically. You see, we know just about where it was, but all traces of that thriving city are now gone. Look at verse 23. He says, and you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. You see, Jesus had stayed in Capernaum for extended period of time because Peter had a home there. And they would often be at Peter's home. It was a thriving and a significant economic center. The people of Capernaum went about their lives with a knowledge of this one called Jesus. They saw many of His miracles and they heard of many more, but they went about their lives indifferent to Him. Well, today you can go and you can visit the ruins of that city. What's the point? Each of these cities were greatly blessed by God. They were important and they were prosperous cities. They were the site of many miracles that Jesus performed, but there was a problem. They did not repent and soon they were swept away into ruin. How should they have responded? Jesus says that the wonders of God performed in their midst should have brought them to a place of repentance. Need I say to you that in God's plan for America, we are instructed to renew our relationship with Him through repentance. That's what it's going to take in America. Not some politician with some plan, but God's plan. And His plan is that we as a people recognize the blessings that God has brought upon us and that we as a nation repent. That is the proper response to the wonders of God. Secondly, repentance is the proper response to the warnings of God. 
It said in verse 22, which I skipped, it said, Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities where Baal was worshipped. Their residents were despised by the people of Israel because of their pagan religion and because of their lifestyle. To say to these people that it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you was quite a stunning remark. But Jesus is the one who said it. Now think of those nations in our world today that you would consider to be evil and apply this truth. You remember President Reagan and his axis of evil? Consider those nations that you would consider to be evil and apply this, and would Jesus not say to America in the day of judgment, because of the great blessings that you have received, because of the great opportunity that you had, will the judgment not be greater for you than for these? Listen to verse 23. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Sodom? We have all heard about Sodom, and we know that it was destroyed for its wickedness. But the Sodomites, whose name became synonymous with sexual perversion, Jesus said, will not be judged as severely as the people of Galilee who refused to repent despite the blessings and the warnings of God. What is God's plan for America? It is that we renew our relationship with Him through repentance. As a nation, we have failed to repent in response to the wonders of God that He has performed in our midst as He has preserved us to this day. But the day of those wonders could easily come to a close. Will it take that for us to respond to God in repentance? We are surely a blind people if we haven't learned from history how quickly powerful nations can fall. In God's plan for America... We are instructed also to revive our relationship with Him, a relationship of revelation, and respond to that revelation. Now the answers for our national woes will not come out of the reasonings of men. The answers rest in those things which must be and are being revealed by the One who is all-knowing. So we must repent and look again to God for direction Now, what was it that He was revealing and what is He revealing today? Well, there was that revelation of God's authority. Look at verse 25. It says, At that time Jesus said... Now, He's just given them a warning. He's just talked to them, laid it out for them, and then we hear Him praying. I praise You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Now what is Jesus saying? He is saying that we must all come like innocent babies who know enough to cry for someone to help us in our time of need. There are those who consider themselves to be wise and intelligent in the ways of the world, and they are going to continue to search for answers. But those who turn to God will be given the insight of the Almighty. And so, cry out to God in your innocence and say, God, I don't have the solution. I don't know what to do, but I believe that you do, and I put all of my trust and all of my confidence in you, totally and completely in you. You see, God has to be our supreme authority or else we will continue to be refused and we will continue to deteriorate as a society. 
Now you go back and study history and you will find easily that our nation was founded on moral principles according to the scriptures. It was not about public opinion. They didn't poll the people of that day and say, well, we know what the scripture says, but what do you think? Now our founding fathers knew that what they needed to do was establish our system, our our judicial system, and all that we did, our moral system, our system of moralities were taken from the Scripture. But our wise and intelligence, our wisdom and our intelligence, those who are wise and intelligent among us, say there's a different way. We need to cast off those things of yesterday. Politicians even accuse people of trying to turn back the page. Go back to a former day. Like that's a bad thing. Well, I want them to turn the page all the way back to the New Testament Christians, all the way back to the New Testament so that we begin to see things the way God sees them, so that we begin to do things the way God would have us to do them. There is that revelation of God's authority that we need to see, we need to accept, and we need to act upon. Secondly, there is the revelation of Christ's authority. Verse 27, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So let me ask you, are there many paths to God? Does Jesus allow for that in His teachings? Is it okay for America to become something other than a God-fearing nation? Is it, an, is it something that we should do when we let it go and we no longer seek to be a Christian nation? Will God still give us direction when we turn our back on the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but even as I move among people, I find that people are still comfortable occasionally mentioning God, whatever they mean by that. They still mention Him. There are those who will even speak of the Lord. But the name of Jesus is something that seems to be just a politically incorrect name. It, it's something that, that they don't want to talk about. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we need to see that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is the authority. It was the same in Chorazin. It was the same in Bethsaida. It was the same in Capernaum. And quickly they were destroyed because they ignored the person of the Lord Jesus. Now we've become so careful about other religions, false religions that deny Jesus Christ, that we have become a nation that does not know God. And God's plan for America... We are instructed to renew our relationship with Him through repentance, to revive our relationship with Him of revelation, where we're looking to Him and what He would reveal to us. And the good news is that Jesus goes on to tell us of something that He will do for us. You see, if we will do this as an individual or as a nation, He will reward our relationship with rest. Now that sounds good. Judgment doesn't sound good, but rest sounds wonderful. He will bless us with the rest of release from our burdens. Did you hear verse 28? Come to me. He didn't say come to my teachings. He didn't say come to someone who represents me. He said come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus. We don't point people to a religious system. We point people to Jesus. Our world is troubled. The people around us are troubled. This is a call that goes out to individuals as well as nations. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest rest. There is one way out of our weariness. There is one way out of our great burdens and that is Jesus said come to me. Now Americans are proud to be seen as industrious people. We want to point to our success and our busyness and yet we are a people who are burdened. 
Now, one of the marks of our generation that will let you know about that is our sleep deprivation. There is no rest. There is no time for rest. There is little time for relaxation with family. Even when we take vacations, they are packed with all kinds of things that we are doing. We are a people who do not know how to rest. Maybe we need to come back and find our rest in Christ and all the busyness and everything else will take its proper place in our life. Surely the invitation of Christ is at least as appealing to us as it might have been to any other previous generation. Let us join the psalmist in his desire not for success or for entertainment, but for God. It says in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? America today is in turmoil. And what we need is that rest that can only come from God. You see, you can find rest in the midst of your problems. You can find rest in the midst of your difficulty. You can find rest in the midst of whatever is taking place in your life or in your nation. If you come to Jesus, He says, come to me and I will give you rest. There's another kind of rest. That is the rest of reclaiming our purpose. Look at what He says in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And how do we perfect our rest in Christ? What we do is we take our, His yoke upon us. He says that yoke is easy, that burden is light. Now the picture of the yoke was one that was common among the rabbis as they would disciple someone. They would call people to take up the yoke. And what they meant by that was they were calling them to a style of discipleship which was intense, that was demanding, and that was extremely challenging. They were calling them to live a life of hard work. They looked at the yoke from an entirely different angle than the Lord. And they're still believers. They're still Christians that look at the yoke just in that way. They say, I don't want to take up that yoke because that's going to be all kinds of sacrifice and all kinds of difficulty. But look at what Jesus says. He equates that yoke that the rabbis equated with difficulty and hard work and perseverance. He equates that with spiritual rest. In his picture, the yoke was seen to be used to couple oxen together so that they would each have a companion in the task and work would be much easier. So Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. He didn't say, I'm going to come and take your yoke. He said, you take my yoke. It's not me saying, okay, Lord, come and help me. It's about me saying, Lord, let me join you. Let my life be about your purposes. Let me get in yoke with you that my service may be blessed, that I might be able to know you in a personal way. Can you imagine those two oxen walking together? In Brazil, we saw the, ox, the teams of oxen that were used to pull wagons. And there were times that those oxen didn't get along very well. And they didn't get any work done because the owner of the oxen had to, had to make peace between them. And if you are resisting Christ and what He's doing in your life, you're not going to make much progress either. But if you'll come along and join Him and let Him guide you. And usually what they'd do is they'd put a, a young ox next to a more mature ox, ox and that more mature one would teach the ways to the younger one so that they would walk together, so that they would pull together, so that they would work together. And as you see them walking down the streets, they weren't struggling and groaning. They were just going on about it. And it seemed like it was as easy as anything, no matter what kind of load that they were carrying. Jesus says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Because you see, He says, then you'll find rest for your souls. And that's what He's inviting each of us to do. When we get in harness with the Lord, we're going to know the joy of great accomplishment. We're going to find fulfillment in our task. 
but we will also find refreshment as we learn of Him and as we draw strength from Him. You see, that's God's plan for you and His plan for me, and that's God's plan for America. Apply it to our nation. See what he was talking about. He started out talking about these cities. Apply it to our nation. A nation that says we're going to identify with God. We are going to follow God. We're going to walk in step with Him. We're going to see the things that are happening in our nation and apply the truths of God to what is taking place in our nation. And God will bless such a nation as that. And my prayer is that revival will come to America and that America will get on its knees and once again we will cry out to God once again we will couple ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ so that he is glorified in this nation if that does not happen if revival does not come the word of Jesus would be woe to you who I have blessed so greatly woe to you You see, He's worked many wonders in our midst, but we've not repented as a nation. He has given us clear warnings, but we have not repented. Don't expect God to look the other way. He lets us know clearly that a society that has greater blessings has less excuse for not coming to Him in repentance. So again this morning, as I know you celebrated Independence Day yesterday, let us pray for a day of not independence but dependence let us pray for the day that our nation sees that we are dependent upon God and that we return to him pray for our country what about you individually he says to every one of us come to me you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest Oh, that sounds so good. Rest. Rest. So come to Him. Lay down your burdens. Take up His life. And you'll be blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that you bow your head, close your eyes for just a moment. I believe that when we are exposed to the Word of God that we need to have time to be able to deal with what we've heard, to deal with this matter. And so right now, I'm going to ask that you do that. What is it that's on your heart? Maybe you come here today and you're troubled. You're not at rest. You're not at peace. Your life is a mess and you know it. There's turmoil in your life. When you come to Him, He says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, He's reaching out to you saying, join me when you choose to do that today. Maybe you're here and you've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what trouble there is in your soul because you're looking for the answers. Take His yoke upon you. Join Him. Find your rest in Him. Place your faith in Him and Him alone. Cry out to Him and say, God, I have sinned against You. God, I've made my own decisions. And now I need to put it all at Your feet. And I accept Your forgiveness today. And I ask You to come into my life and be my Lord and my Master. And Lord, it is my my desire today that I would follow You all the days of my life. What is it the Lord would have You to pray? What is it that He'd have You to do? I'll be here at the front if someone needs me to pray with them about something. But You enter into that place of personal reflection and personal decision.
Father, I pray that you would bless your word. Let us not put our reasoning, our own prejudices, our own values ahead of you. But dear God, let us see things as you see them. Let us respond as you would lead us to respond. And let us pray. Father, right now, along with others who are burdened for our country, I pray for the United States of America. Lord, I pray that revival would come, that our nation would return to You. Dear God, I trust You, and, and I just pray You'll do whatever in Your wisdom that You would do to bring the people to Yourself, because we know that this is a matter of eternity. Give us that burden for our nation, for our state, for our community. And Father, I pray for that soul that is here today that has come troubled, distressed. I pray, dear God, that they would let You be their peace as they turn from their own reasonings and allow You to give them comfort and strength. I pray that You'll do this in a way that glorifies Yourself. For Lord, that is our greatest purpose, that we might glorify You. And Lord, I pray in every time that we are anxious, that we will trust You. And we will turn it over to You but that we will not close our eyes to that which is going on around us. Continue to speak to us. Encourage every soul here to look back into Your Word this week to see what You'd have to say to them. We praise You and thank You in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you for coming, being here on this, uh, what is for our nation, this holiday weekend. Thank you for coming. We do have a time of fellowship following. You just go through this door and out the other and and to the other building, and there's some coffee there. I already know of one sweet treat that's over there, and I'm going to make my way there and take part in that. So I hope that you will as well. And let me just say to you, those of you who are parents, number one, we would love for you to have your children as, and your neighbor's children as a part of our children's camp that's taking place August 10th to the 14th. Number two, uh, we are concerned, very concerned about the safety of our children here in this place. And so what we, are, and what we want to do is once the children go out to Children's Church, we're going to let one of these ushers go over and lock that door so that nobody from the outside can get in. Now, if you need the facilities for any reason, all you have to do is come there and knock at the door and the preschool workers are up there and one of them will come and open the door and let you in. They'll know why you're there. Just just come knock at the door and they'll gently open the door. The, don't worry about the kids. They can always get out there. Is that uh, You can get out with that when you can't get in. And so don't worry about that. But we want to keep the children of this church safe. And we'll go to any length to do that. So, So if it's a little inconvenient for you, Okay, I take that to the Lord, but um, but we'll we'll seek to if we didn't do that today, we'll seek to start doing that next week so that our children might be protected. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Please join us for this time of fellowship. If not, please come back and worship with us as soon as you can. God bless you. You're dismissed.